Bill Bennett, you talk a lot about American virtues in your writings of 17 books or so. One of the things that you wrote in a book called The Sacred Honor, you wrote this, the virtues I've chosen to highlight in this collection, of course, are not the exclusive property of the American people. Other cultures and peoples share them and might aspire to embrace them. But having said that, I would emphasize that there is something very American about these virtues. And then you list some of the virtues, such as being patriotism and courage, love and courtship, civility and friendship, um, education of the head and the heart, um, industry and frugality, justice and piety. Why are those American virtues? Well, because we believe in them and we have for a long time. It's the uh, 4th of July, uh, a great pleasure to be here on the 4th of July. Um, Calvin Coolidge, an underestimated thinker, said uh, in his 4th of July address, I think it was 1926, he said, we have done some things in this country that are final. He said, when we hearken back to the Declaration of Independence and we say things like, we hold these truths to be self-evident, all men are created equal. He said, that is final. All men are created equal. That is final. Endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. That is final. Uh, people deri authorities derive just powers from the consent of the government. He says, that's final. He said, if we move in some direction on those, we're going to move backwards. Those things were settled 234 years ago. So these are, those things I just mentioned are American principles enshrined in the Declaration. And these other things that I talk about in Sacred Honor and the Book of Virtues are American virtues because we believe in them, we've held to them. Now, they're not necessarily uniquely American virtues. And one reason I wrote the biggest book I ever wrote, or best-selling book, The Book of Virtues, was because teachers said, how do we teach values, that was the word they used, to students with all these different backgrounds. And I said, well, there are certain values or virtues which are shared pretty much universally. And we celebrate them here. We're explicit about them here. We like to think we teach them here. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. Um, I said, do you have, you know, people said, we have kids from 62 different countries. You know, how do we teach values there? And I said, do you have girls who like to be uh, pawed at? Uh, do you have boys who like to be bullied? Do you have people who like to have their lunch money stolen? We can agree on those things. Too many debates about values, virtues, and ethics focus on the things we disagree about and not the things we agree about. So that's what I was highlighting there. And in, in the book, Our Sacred Honor, I was talking about the founders on these principles. And they were so emphatic about the need for these virtues that I think it's become instilled in the American character. When you talk about the virtues and, and you make statements like that, you talk about hearing from teachers. Who else do you hear from? And what do they say when, when they, you're, your supporters and those who disagree with you about these kind of ideas. Somebody tried to do what they called a, uh, what was it, a radical or liberal book of virtues. And I said, no, 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 this isn't a conservative book of virtues. This isn't a political book. Uh, this is the book of virtues. These are about individual virtues. What are they? Loyalty and honesty and perseverance and courage and compassion. And by the way, um, people have them who are liberal and people have them who are conservative. And people who are conservative with whom I agree politically sometimes lack some of these virtues. Uh, and people with whom I disagree politically, some liberals or left-wing people, may have the virtues. These are, model, these are aspects, marks, to go back to the original meaning of the word, of individual, of individual character. This wasn't uh, a political enterprise of mine. My books aren't. They tend not to be. Um, occasionally, uh, we get into politics. But for the most part, this is... Uh, I did my work in philosophy, and um, I was a teacher, and uh, this is what I try to do in the books. When you talk about philosophy and you talk about virtues, that's one thing. What do you think about the state of American sentiment, how people feel about being an American and, and being in this country? Because uh, you write those, along those themes as well. It's mixed. Um, I don't think we appreciate it enough. My history books are called America, the Last Best Hope, and that's there as a reminder of the kind of country we're in. I don't think people appreciate uh, enough. If I could have added one more virtue to the 10 in the Book of Virtues, I would have added the virtue of gratitude. It's a very important thing to be grateful, to give thanks to your country, um, for your family, for your friends, uh, for your safety, for your freedom. We had a very special day yesterday on this 4th of July weekend, the highlight of our 4th of July weekend, if I might just describe it, our younger son graduated from uh, OCS, Officer Candidate School in Quantico. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's a rising senior at Princeton University and um, did this grueling 
grueling isn't the word for it. You know, these guys are really put to it. And he graduated yesterday, and he did very well. And um, very moving ceremony, very simple ceremony. And um, it reminded you of uh, those men who stand in the breach to protect the rest of us. Um, and we should appreciate it. Today's the day to appreciate it. Every day is the day, but we, we sure ought to do it this day. You talk a little bit about sentiment when you wrote the book, Why We Fight. What was that book centering around? That book was about 9-11. Uh, it was written in April of the next year, um, 2002. And it was about why we fight, what the, what the argument was for uh, the fighting we were in. Everybody knew we were bombed on 9-11, but who were we fighting against and why? And I felt we needed that book because I feared that we would lose focus about who our enemy is, what we were doing, what it would take to defeat the enemy. About the same time, I started a group with some others called Americans for Victory Over Terrorism. And uh, there was some scoffing in the press at that. They said, what do you need this for? I said, to fortify public belief in this war against Islamist terror. And people said, you don't need any fortification for that. This, everybody's four square for this. I said, in time, it will weaken, as many things do in time. And uh, it has. And uh, so I'm glad I wrote that book. I'm now writing another book, um, pretty much about the same topic, called The Fight of Our Lives, because I think we're losing focus. Some of this talk about Afghanistan lately, I mm -hmm. think, is uh, unsettling. Uh, back then, though, this is what you wrote in the book. Yep. You said that what was accomplished by the relentless critique of American reality and American ideals was this. It turned a simple and noble impulse, love of country, into a suspect category, or just as corrosively, an unfashionable one. Yeah. Can you expand on that? Yeah, patriotism has become, in many places, a down-market commodity. Um, I remember after 9-11, this enormous display of flags all around the country, in all communities, all ethnicities, all neighborhoods. And uh, people, uh, some people would just talk about flag-waving. You know, they would just disparage it with the back of their hand as if there were, this were something low-grade, you know, down-market, uh, unsophisticated. Uh, the night uh, of 9-11, there were teach-ins on campuses around the country. I highlight some of this in this book you're describing. My alma mater had a teach-in and talked about what did America do to uh, deserve this, to earn this attack. There was a memorial service at uh, my alma mater, and uh, it was mostly attended by a few students and people from buildings and grounds, the employees, and not by a lot of faculty members. I come from the university. I have a PhD in philosophy. I used to teach. And it pains me that some very, very bright people uh, in the academic world have taken um, a posture of opposition. You know, uh, George Steiner has a phrase, the great literary critic, he says, Odi profanum vulgus. I hate the vulgar crowd. If they're for it, if the great mass of people are for it, uh, I'm opposed to it. And there is some of that and some of that in a very pronounced way when it comes to American patriotism. Uh, do you still find that kind of the, the same time of intensity stemming uh, even so many years after 9-11? Oh, yeah, sure. No, I, I, <laughs> I often look at the, um, uh, there's, there are these surveys of academics and, you know, what are your, what's your political position by profession? The last time I looked at mine, philosophy, I think it was zero for conservatives, <laughs> zero self-identified. Couldn't you have one guy just to break away from the pack? You know, the left was overloaded, moderates, there were, there were a fair number. Yeah, now, I, I don't object to, in a free society, obviously, you have a lot of uh, free thinkers, you have a lot of intellectuals. What I object to is the weight that, uh, the preponderance, that academic departments don't try to balance. When we did Americans' Victory Over Terrorism, we went around to um, campuses, Columbia and Harvard and UCLA, and we would make arguments for the war. The interesting thing wasn't so much the making of the arguments as, as the students who would say to us, I, had, I hadn't heard that argument before. I'd never heard it before. You should hear that argument. You can hear the counter-argument too, and should, but you should hear that argument as well. I, I mean, a free society, and an open society um, should have room for all thoughtful opinions about important questions. There are no closed questions in our open society. The most recent book that you have out there is called A Century Turn, You Hopes, You Fears. Right. Uh, you wrote this in companion to other the America books that you wrote? Yes. Uh, I have a two-volume, up till then, a two-volume uh, series called America, The Last Best Hope, History of the United States. I wrote the third volume in part because one of the most exciting things that's ever happened in my life, um, my two-volume history, very well-reviewed, 
again, across the political spectrum, which I was very proud of, not a political book, but a good history book, uh, has been adopted by Houghton Mifflin Harcourt and will be distributed starting this year in the public schools for those who want it.